Hi everyone, welcome back um, for our last presentation of this year's Inclusive Theater Festival. This is someone I'm obviously so excited to bring on uh, and I'm so honored to be able to introduce her to all of you. Claudia Alec is a performer, producer, designer, writer, and inclusion expert. She's currently a curator and access doula with the Cryptech Incubator and Cryptech Gray Area Metaverse. She's founding producer of the transmedia social justice company Calling Up, whose projects include producing in pandemic, the Every 28 Hours plays, We Charge Genocide TV, Justice Producers, co-artistic direction of the Build Convening with Fool's Fury. Claudia acts as a consultant to funders and companies around the country. She served as co-president of the board of NET for seven years, an advisor for the National Theatre Project for six years, and co-produced Unsettling Dramaturgy, Crip and Indigenous International D Digital Colloquium, and is an advisor to HowlRound Digital Theatre Commons. She has performed with NY New Futurists and on many podcasts and live streams. Her online racial justice practice is reaching thousands weekly. She is producing performances of justice on stage, online, and in real life. She has been the most wonderful mentor, and I am glad that now we all get the chance to learn from her. All yours, Claudia. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for having me, Ashna. So what I'm gonna do is share screen, and I've got a PowerPoint, and I'm gonna share some information, and then later on, I'm going to be inviting potentially a couple of people to come join me on stage to, to reflect on this amazing thing that we did together. So let me um, share my screen. Here we go, we're sharing the screen. And I am hitting the present button. I think that's what does it. Hey, and now we're presenting. Welcome to Calling Up Justice Across Space and Time. And this is just a little lecture on digital and hybrid producing for the Inclusive Theater Festival in 2023. My name's Claudia Alec. I'm an inter I'm an intersectional inclusion expert. I'm the founder of Calling Up Justice. I'm a writer, performer, director, designer, teacher. And my access check-in is that... I am, uh, um, I'm actually doing pretty well. I, I sometimes will let people know that I have a pain disorder. So sometimes I might pull a face and it has nothing to do with what you said or our conversation, but feel, I'm feeling good. I feel like all of my access needs are met. Today, I'm going to be talking about, we're doing some like opening moments to, to warm us up, let, let you know who I am. We're going to check out um, that Minty meter that folks have been doing. So folks have been doing sort of like a group practice thing all day yesterday and a little bit today. So we're going to do that together. Then I'm going to talk through the principles of hybrid and remote convening. I'm going to give you a few examples in practice. Then we're going to talk about this awesome festival. And then of course, we're going to land on Y access. All right. So this first QR code that I have for you. It says, what do you come to the Inclusive Theater Festival for? And I'm going to invite you to pick up your cell phone or a device that you have and see if you can trigger that QR code if you haven't already. This performance is one where we were brainstorming, what are some ways to help us feel more connected throughout space and time with the people who are there physically in Chicago in the space? Because I got to watch you all through a window, but it's nice to be able to make something collaborative. So this is asking you, what do you come to the Inclusive Theater Festival for? And right now, hopefully, you are all answering that question in the Mentimeter. And then we'll later on, we'll look at all of our answers combined. And it's fully anonymized, too. So I'll have no idea who wrote what, but well, it'll be exciting. I know that there were entries from yesterday. So I'm excited to see what we, what we all say together. And this second um, is share a moment you loved in accessibility. So that first output is going to be like a word cloud. And the second output is going to be more of a tone poem, me saying things that you loved. So share a moment you loved in accessibility. It might've been something you, you saw modeled by Sins and Valid. Maybe it was something you actually experienced here in the Inclusive Theater Festival. Possibly it's something that you're recalling from your own um, accessible practice. So go ahead, make sure you put those ideas in there because I am going to be sharing them collectively at the end of this presentation. And I'm excited to hear any moments that you loved in accessibility. Here's the other good piece of news. 
those two links, they were dropped in the, I might ask, I don't know if you have these links on hand again, Ashna, but if you can drop them in the chat one more time, because I'm going to keep us moving, right? But you can take your time in, in responding to these. It's always nice to like collectively take a moment though, to, to, um, to frame the invitation and to let folks know where it is and how to access it and to give people a little bit of time to do it. But you can also keep working on it as I move us forward. Two, principles of hybrid and remote convening. All right, now let's see if I can move this so I can see my presentation show. Clarity and purpose and roles. Oftentimes when you're collaborating in a physically shared space, there can be a little bit of um, on the fly, in real time trading of responsibilities because you're all there in the same physical time and space. But if you are working remotely, the person who needs to make the contact list needs to know that it's their responsibility to make the contact list. Um, people need to understand what their roles are. Um, is my role to be a moderator in the chat? Is my role like, what are your roles? And what are, what are what's the purpose of us gathering? Why are we gathering in this digital space? Or why are we trying to do hybrid connectivity moments? And it's important to share those reasons why with your fellow collaborators since you're doing sort of a, collective uh, performance of justice together. Okay, go to the next one. There we go. Technology selection. So um, what's the technology that you're using and what's the platform that you're using? I will always uh, be mad at somebody who says Zoom theater because uh, that is doing all of us a gigantic disservice. There are so many tools that we use to gather and convene and create creative work digitally. And Zoom is only one of the platforms that we use. It is one that right now, I think because of the choices that were made in 2020, a lot of people have familiarity with it. But there are a lot of different technology technologies and platforms you can use for creating things together feeling like you're in the same space and time. Um, so you should think about how many attendees do you have? Do you want your attendees to feel like they're in the same physical space and time? Is it okay for, do you want your attendees to, to not have to see all of the production work so they can just lean back and enjoy it through the screen? What's the experience you want people to have? And will it be compatible with their devices? Like I'm thinking through, who's my audience? Where are they located? Are they are they coming to me through their phone? Are they coming to me through a laptop computer? Just like, what's the, what's the point of connection? And have I made multiple points of connection? And have I designed the aesthetics around them for that? What are the interactive elements? Again, in physically shared space, just the act of being together in a room is already interactive and awesome. The thing is, when you're meeting digitally through a computer, oftentimes you can default to just like I'm watching a TV show, right? You can default to a space where you're not actually engaging, but it's, it, it's extra labor, it's extra work. So you as the organizer, need to create opportunities and invitations and pathways for people to engage with you. For instance, I'm going to uh, give this invitation to all of our friends in the space. I'm about to say a lot of stuff. I'm going to be naming platforms, ways of doing stuff. Um, I, I'm not going to pause while I'm doing it. Please place questions in the chat. If I mention a platform where you're like, what's happened to? Why would I want to do that? If you want me to go further or more deeper into an idea, go ahead. I want to invite you all to engage in the chat. And also, if you feel like there's something that I said that you're like, yeah, to that, go ahead and be like, yeah, just take the words, yeah, and exclamation point in the chat. Let's get the chat um, feeling like it is um, active and engaged. All right, so. You can have Q&A sessions, you can have polls, you can have chat rooms, um, you can have networking opportunities like the one that you uh, that you had um, where we got to go into breakout rooms and, and meet people and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So there are a lot of different ways you can design in ways to be interactive. And of course, clear communication. And when I say clear communication, it doesn't just mean I'm speaking with clarity. It means good, immediate, 
and good asynchronous communication channels. So for instance, I got I can get information from your website. I might be able to get information from an email that was sent to me. Maybe that email has links and locations and dots, dots, dots. But maybe I'm still confused because we're producing hybrid remote. I can't just find you and talk to you. So can I have a place for immediate communication? I'm holding up my cell phone here. It's getting a little lost in the green screen of it all. Um, can I um, uh, go to a Discord server where you have a couple of helpers? They're just sitting there ready to go. Is there a, um, a signal or WhatsApp or text chain that I could access to, um, to communicate with people in real time? Good immediate and a asynchronous communication channels. Um, and again, I'm going to try and just mention spe specificities around this when I get to the examples in practice. And then the last principle is post-event materials. Um, the beauty of producing in hybrid and remote shapes and frameworks is that we get to uh, uh, produce and connect and create community asynchronously. So design your materials thoughtfully so that people can access them in the future. Now, I know that when it comes to like just straight up physically shared space, some of the practices I had when I was in my early 20s, and I, I got these boxes full of postcards because I would keep the postcard and the program and the physical paraphernalia of the theater event that I went to. And I value them deeply. When you're producing hybrid and remote, are you creating paraphernalia that people could, could have? as a souvenir, as a keepsake, as a reminder, as a memento to help them remember the things that they did in the past. And that could be as simple as, oh, I sent you a PDF. Now you can save it. You can print it off yourself if you want to and put it in a big old box like me. <laughs> All right. So now I want to talk about examples and practice and checking the time. All right. We're doing okay. I have to say, y'all, I packed too much into this presentation. So, Ashna, I will be asking you to maybe wave your hand at me um, if it seems like I'm going over time. All right. So this first example, this was a, this is hybrid community performance. This is the Festival of Masks. It's produced in L.A. It's an annual event that they produce. It's produced by L.A. Commons um, in collaboration with Lamert Park and, uh, and, and, some, and other organizations, Bill Caldwell's, Ben Caldwell's organization. And it's usually held in this specific place, Lamert Park. It's about the neighborhood, but it's also about bringing that specific Black neighborhood into collaboration with Africa, the diaspora. So they so they have a lot of um, African artists come in, fly in, and do live performances. And then they have classroom workshops where the kids come to the park and make masks, and then they do like a little march with all the masks, and it's so adorable. So how do you... How do you have the same outcomes, but digitally, right? And also, this is all old heads. None of these folks are like, I have all the devices and I know Discord and I'm on the line all the time. They are not on the line. They didn't know what the line was and we had to build the lines for them. So this is what we did. Um, we have two hosts. You'll note that our two facilitator hosts, they've, they're, they're on a background. We had our artists use photos of their past gatherings to create visual landscapes that helped you feel like you were reminded of the beauty and pageantry of the past backgrounds. Then for weeks prior to the festival, we had the students meeting in Facebook Lives, doing workshops, making their masks. Then those were all recorded. And then we had somebody edit together those beautiful things to make these little videos that were like videos celebrating the mass meeting, videos celebrating that community aspect. But all of the kids and their parents, they were all in the Zoom with us. We realized that we were trying to do a presentation where if we were asking people to perform live, it would it would cause gigantic amounts of chaos with an OBS because these were not these weren't performers. So we need to create something where we could all like a couple hundred people could be in a Zoom and people could turn their camera on and off as they wanted to and it wouldn't interrupt the performance. Um, so we had a lot of pre-taped materials and in many ways it was like a watch party that was also being live streamed. And then it was also including pieces of, um, of us in the audience. So this was, there's a libation ceremony that they start their thing off with. So we had the libation ceremony take place live. So we live streamed the libation ceremony from a from a space that had Wi-Fi. We had people 
interview shops and businesses in the neighborhood and do little tiny spotlights about what well what what the what do the ancestors do to honor with uh, do uh, do you honor with your work and questions like that around black pride we also had um um there was this gorgeous dance piece that they produced on the square it was it was a video recording so it was edited so it was an asynchronous but it brought us to feel like we were close and in that place all right hey hey computer there we go. All right. Oh, um, uh, I've gone. I've gone too far. There we go. <laughs> um, virtual community performances. Recently, this was so. I'm talking to you about that. That was hybrid. That was about bringing together that very specific space. So we had people in the square while we were live streaming, and we were bringing it together in the same time. These two virtual community performances were exclusively digital. We knew that the audiences would be all inside their houses. The virtual pride was produced by Calling Up Justice in One Free Community because so many of our community members couldn't attend pride because there was less masking in 2023. A lot of the COVID safe protocols that had been put in place for 2021 had been let go and folks were feeling at a loss. So um, we knew we had an international audience so we produced something that was, had all day programming inside of a Zoom where people could fully participate. And then we also had evening programming that we presented through a live stream. We also, um, I wanna mention the virtual protest performance that we just produced. This was done on November 4th, y'all. So there were all of these protests taking place all over the country. Many people wanted to join them, but they couldn't. So. We get about 500 people. They sign up to attend. We have 100 of them inside the Zoom with us. While we're inside the Zoom, we are attending actual protests, a curated selection of actual protests. So we're going to somebody's live stream, and then we are giving them support in that live stream. So it's like 100 of us audiencing together for somebody else's live stream. But we are also, it's a live stream inside of a live stream. So we've got that live stream inside our live stream. So for, for people who are outside of the One Free community, uh, people who are outside of Calling Up Justice, about 400 people, they can all witness it through that Twitch stream that we're producing. Then you've got a hundred people inside. We're watching a TikTok stream and we're being transported from Philadelphia to Washington, DC. Now we're in Canada watching the Indian Collective do amazing speeches about Palestine and indigenous rights in Canada. And it's really moving. Then everybody goes off into breakout rooms, does, bre does work in there. And then at the in the final moments, we come back together and we listened to this um, podcast that we just produced. So in 2021, I had a series of plays called the Every 28 Hours Plays. They're short plays that deal with racial justice. They're all about a minute long, and they were developed in Ferguson um, during dur during that time of, of during that specific time of unrest, right? So. Um, in 2021, I knew we wanted to have engagement with these plays. One of my interns, um, Karina, had this great idea. So Karina and Sabina got together and were like, we're going to make a podcast where we read one play and we invite all of the people who are involved in the making of that play and also people who would just be interested in it. And then we're going to have an intense conversation about it. The outcome, y'all, the outcome was supposed to be 20 minutes long. It's a 75 minute, 75 minutes long, this one. Why? Because it was so, the conversation was so deep. So we have Iman Aoun. She's the artistic director of a theater um, in Israel. I'm a Palestinian theater in Israel, and she's currently producing the Gaza monologues right now. Um, there's Karina there. We've got all of these great theater artists. And it was Part of the point of these um, digital encounters is that it allows us to all very quickly have a theatrical experience and listening to that play and listening to people experience that play was really powerful. Um, I, I'm gonna very quickly talk about a couple of aspects that we did with the production of Electra that I directed. I directed a production of Electra with the Women's Theater Festival and Access Classics. Access Classics is run by um, uh, Heather Andersma and Michaela Goldhaber. And Michaela Goldhaber is also the artistic director of the Rye Crips, which is a disabled playwriting collective. And they came to me and they were like, we want to do Electra and Orestes and we'd like for you to direct it. And I was like, awesome. First, we're only doing Electra because if we try to do Electra and Orestes, it will be too much and it will break all of us. So we're only doing Electra. And then I was like, we're going to we're going to make this accessible from the very beginning. So we knew 
This will be a purely digital production. This gives us the freedom of having an actor in Canada and an actor in Jamaica join us. So we can say yes to the performers, um, regardless of space and time. Um, we hire these two amazing sign language interpreters, uh, Kira Buck and Angelique. Oh, I'm going to mess up her name. Dang it. They partnered. After they worked with us, they made their own company. So Ghost Light Interpreting came to be because of the amazing experience that they had with each other. And I just want to recommend, I think other people have already recommended this, um, start with access and have your access uh, workers in the creative process with you. Now, of course, we were working with Antoine Hunter as a performer. So we wanted our sign language interpreters to be there for every single rehearsal. We also, um, Heather Andersma was the one who triggered all of the captions. For us, AI captions were not going to do what we needed them to do. We needed our captions to be very, very accurate. And also, sometimes they were in Greek. They were literally in Greek. So, Heather Andersma took on the extra labor of manually entering them into the captioning device and then triggering them for each production. I'm gonna get a drink of water. Mm. So aspects to keep in mind for this production were starting with access. The first rehearsal was a conversation about access needs and what, what shifts and changes would we wanna do to make sure everybody's needs were met and then also coming up with language for how do we pause if we need to do an access hold in real time to 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 change something to make it more accessible for all of us oh i'm so tempted to give you a piece a piece of this production but i don't think we have time so i'm going to move us on we can go back if we think we have if we have time but i want to make sure we actually have we we get to talk about the entire hybrid theater festival Mm. All right, I'm accidentally showing it to you. That was not on purpose. There we go. All right, the next thing I'm going to talk to you about is this digital convening. So this was, yeah, this was the first digital convening that I produced. And it was, uh, I was working with the uh, Fool's Fury Theater Company. They would do a theater festival and convening every two years where they would bring ensemble theater makers, ensemble companies from all over the country, produce this huge festival, and then have these workshops and uh, really good conversations about just the theater and the field. And I personally believe that it was actually a really important event that was taking place that was helping to uh, uh, tie together pieces of the ensemble uh, theater community. Unfortunately, we weren't able to do the festival because of the pandemic. And then that was the year that a lot of people's plays didn't happen. So they were sad about it. So we ended up producing something where we invented it and I called it Microturgy. Microturgy was when we brought a dramaturg. We partnered with LNDA. So we, we partnered with Literary Managers Dramaturgs of America. I think that's what the acronym sounds for. Maybe it's association. Anyway, we partnered with LNDA and a dramaturg was paired with each ensemble. And then they created a one minute presentation or a two minute presentation that was a shadow of what the thing was going to be or was supposed to be. Some people just spoke directly to the camera. Some people produced full excerpts and it was artistically exciting and engaging. And it was also grief work. So this was trauma-informed producing. This was uh, myself and, and Deborah Eliezer really understanding that this event, this convening, wasn't just about producing professional outcomes, but this was about giving everybody some spaces to grieve, to, to feel like they could really uh, grapple with, with the time and space that we were in. So like all of the workshops were, were specifically designed to help build power for everyone. This event was held in Hopin too. So it was held in a conference platform so that people could feel like they were all 
in the, in the same space, but also they could come in and out. Inside the Hop Into platform, there was a section where you could watch videos like we are right now in kind of a Zoom area, but then you could exit and go to another section where there were, where it was kind of designed where you could have um, booths where people could be in a, would be in a room and you'd go into the room and you could talk to somebody. And it was as if you were kind of in a, in a, in a, in a lecture hall with people at different tables, you could talk to them about their different companies, et cetera. Um, I just last week, was this last week? No, was this last, this was last week. Y'all I'm doing too much. This was last week. So um, there was a convening in, in uh, New Orleans. I myself am not, I'm, I still wasn't feeling safe enough to get on a plane and go to New Orleans for this convening, but I really needed to talk to my fellow ensemble theater makers. And this was the Network of Ensemble Theaters uh, National Gathering. And they did the best things. Like not only did they, they had incredibly great COVID safe protocols. They did really beautiful work in gathering people physically in time and space. But then they also designed a hybrid mod uh, piece of it. And then they recognized that we were having super deep conversations about strategic planning trying to design for the future. And so in those moments, um, we ended up um, needing to come together. And so they presented us the, from the Zoom on a big screen for that audience so that we could come together. And there were moments where we were text messaging with uh, colleagues, trading pictures, et cetera. And again, it's, it's about how do you build community when gathering in physical space can sometimes be difficult, not only because of the price of tickets, not only because of our own, um, the, the extra labor that we have to do to pay our bills, which might mean that we can't go out of town for a couple of days. So this was this was a really huge step for the Network of Ensemble Theaters. Um, and uh, we felt really proud of being able to successfully convene in this hybrid style. And I was just, just beautiful. I just can't do, I can't do enough shout outs to the Bridge Ensemble for building that. And some of the tools that we used for that were, and these are some of the tools that were used for this convening as well. You'll see right here, this is a link tree. It was just a simple link tree where they had the travel kit, the event program. The event program was done like this. This on the side here is a link from the event program. The event program was in Canva and it was one of those interactive canvas. So this map was an actual movable map. So you can move it around, find places in New Orleans if you're physically there, right? But you have the schedule at a glance, dietary. This was also, they had forms, right? This is about accessibility. So we had forms here to say, what are your dietary preferences to make sure we know what we need to know to make sure everybody is safe? COVID test form to find out so you don't have to physically come to tell us, right? That kind of stuff. All right. Um, uh, Padlet is another tool that was used for net. And I was just like, let me use another one to give us some variety. And I believe this event has a Padlet as well. The beautiful thing about Padlet is and uh, in 2020, I was looking for tools that anybody could use for free. I was trying to find tools that would be easy to use, low barrier of learning how to use it, low cost barrier, and also accessible to outside users. So Padlet's useful because I can make a Padlet and then you don't have to sign up to join Padlet to engage with it as a tool, which is super useful. Um, there's a barrier to entry. Every time you have to fill out a form or do something, it's the equivalent of walking half a block to go through a door. So I was just trying to decide how many barriers am I trying, am I going to put between you and the thing that I want you to engage with? This last piece um, uh, is a an example of transmedia digital art uh, and performance. So this Why Mask project, it started off, um, it, it mostly started off because I was like, I, I was trying to write an essay about accessibility in theater and I kept being so angry about masking. And I was like, Claudia, you need to find a softer entry point. And I was like, well, how about I just create a project that invites people to tell me why they're masking? So instead of me trying to tell people why they should be masking, how about I just allow the people who are doing the thing that's creating the accessibility to tell me their beautiful story? And then we have these signs. Now, these signs have been, I think, placed in four different galleries and three different performance locations so far. Um, and uh, the last engagement we had with this Why Mask, it made me understand that it has to be a performance piece. It's the One of the outcomes is this beautiful digital gallery of faces. And to a certain extent, I initially thought that's the art. 
That's not the art. The art is the performance of, of inviting people to add their mask to the Why Mask Project. Um, and so we um, held space at this festival. We had this beautiful access station that had hand sanitizers and masks and free masks and all of that. And that's where we discovered that piece of the performance. But I'm mentioning this mostly because I wanted to mention the art of QR codes. QR codes are amazing ways to bring people, they're like little portals across space and time. But I did find that with this performance, I couldn't just have a sign that said, do it. It required a person coaching them through it. Performance and art takes people. And now we're here at the Inclusive Theater Festival. Come on, y'all. These are actual screen caps I took from HowlRound off of my own darn computer. Look at that. Look at these little people saying things in the chat. I love it. There's you, Ashna, being graceful and yesterday being like, come back tomorrow. And you'll note, here's this beautiful sign that has another QR code on it. Um, I wanted to do a shout out. The reason I took a screen cap of, this was the last speaker from yesterday. What was their name, Ashna? Could you remind me of their name? Yes, it was Tina Childress. Tina Childress. Their present, everybody's presentations were just mwah, chef's kiss. What I really loved about this presentation was that that QR code worked. It worked through the live stream. I wasn't sure if it was going to because it is a projection onto a wall and then, and then it's a camera capturing that. So sometimes that can create a little bit of wept and wharf. It was beautiful. Um, and it was, it allowed me, she had offered to give visual descriptions of every slide. That would have added to the time of their presentation, taking away from time for us to listen to stuff. And also, it, I think it would have broken up their presentation a little bit. So I was grateful that I didn't have to request it because I was about to request it because I was like, that's so tiny. I can't see what's on there. But then by by allowing me to do this, boom, I could, I could access the slides over my phone, and it was a beautiful moment in accessibility. I loved it. Um, and then, of course, today, we've been fully inside the Zoom. Um, and I, I just got to do a shout out for, uh, I already did this, but I'll do it again, the networking moment. It was really delightful to be able to talk to somebody. And I'm going to say, I'm going to say this. I tried to say goodbye to Nomi, and Nomi disappeared in a puff of smoke. That's one of the things that I cannot stand about these digital spaces where before you have a chance to be like, Hell yeah, they could just leave the digital space. So it's beautiful to design in spaces and places and time for us to exchange with each other. That's great. Um, I also wanna do some shout out to Momo's uh, presentation because Momo, was engaging in really uh, communicative visual artifacts. So I just want folks, if you didn't already and you're here for the replay, check out that presentation and, and learn from the way they were using visuals to communicate. All right, that's that's the that's this is this is the chance where I'm supposed to invite people to join me on stage. So who do we have here that did a presentation? um from earlier is terry in the house i would love to talk to terry y'all terry's presentation was here let me stop or stop sharing the screen and just do a little shout out y'all terry's presentation was so cool because terry was live streaming from a location and then was being projected into the physically shared space and then i was watching the live stream of that projection so it just felt like um layers of accessibility and also just presencing in a really cool way welcome 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 terry i just want to hand you the proverbial microphone for a moment and just invite you to reflect on on any ideas around remote or hybrid convening and how this experience was for you uh Hi everyone, I'm Terry, and I did indeed present yesterday. I really appreciated the organizer's flexibility because I was initially invited to present in person. And I went, you know, as an immunocompromised person without masking mandates happening, I do not feel safe presenting in person. Can you let me live stream? And they were just like, yeah. And we need more of that, please. 
because, you know, there's, there was nothing in my presentation that absolutely required my physical presence. And I actually really liked that I was presenting remotely on the in-person day because I'm like, this to me feels like just a little bit of like crip activism here where I'm like, yes, this space is not accessible to me. And I want you to think about that as I give this presentation. So that is what my experience has been like. The networking was also really fun. And this has been, you know, I have actually been trying to like connect with sins invalid forever and so like I've now been introduced to those people so I really think that this has been a fun and creative and cool way to do this and Claudia I just am in awe of the work that you've done and I am just like yes we need more of this because the thing is that, that I really keep wanting people to realize is that the need for remote access did not start in March 2020. It did not start in March, 2020. There have been homebound people, people with fatigue issues, people with movement issues, people with physical access issues, people with overstimulation issues who have been shut out from the arts forever. And we have the technology to stop it and we just need to want to. So there's really no reason at the end of the day other than lack of resources or lack of desire and the first one is easier to fight than the second one, unfortunately, that really any art made can't be accessible digitally. Yes, 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 yes. And Terry, you know, I, I feel like we were taking tiny baby steps towards that world and world in 2020. And I got so excited because y'all, I'm disabled, right? I have a human body that sometimes is like, oh, you you don't think you're not getting out of the bed. That's not happening for you. <laughs> and I don't know when that's going to happen, unfortunately, right? So I can make all the plans I want, which means I sometimes can't commit to being in a play if it means I have to be on a stage at a specific time and play. Uh, three months in the future. That's a dangerous commitment for me to make. 2020, I got to be in plays. I got to be in a bunch of plays. Also, I got to collaborate with my friends in New York Neo Futurists. I hadn't been able, you know, it had always been a promise. I was like, I'm going to get back to New York and I'll stay there for a couple of weeks and I'll do a run. But the timing never worked out. And I get, and then, and then a pandemic hit and a pandemic hit. And suddenly they were like, oh, let's do a digital show. And now I can collaborate with my colleagues again. And it's beautiful. I'm remembering 2019. Oh, y'all, this was actually 2020. It was right before the pandemic hit. I was supposed to be doing a project with um, the National Disability Theater. And I caught the worst cold of my life. I sometimes wonder if maybe it was COVID. Who knows? All I know is like I I was so sick that I told my roommates, I'm quarantining myself. Don't come on, don't come in my side of the house and I'll use my private bathroom. Um, and I called the National Disability Theater and I was like, I'm so sorry, I'm too sick to get on the plane. I should not. I, I was like, I think I could pull it together and get there but I think I would get everybody sick and that would be a disservice. And they were like, what if we presented you on a screen in the room? We really, really want to hear your, your comments and stuff. And I was like, okay. And so that was my first moment prior to the pandemic. It was possible. It was always possible. And it was always necessary. It was always possible. It was always necessary. So shout out to National Disability Theater uh, for that moment of accessibility that they produced with us. Um, is there anybody else in the house right now here with us that was a part of uh, this experience? I know we're coming towards our, our, our closing times, um, but I'm just wondering, is there anybody else who um, was a presenter who wanted to share any words or, or experiences? I just want to make sure I'm giving you time and space. Dr. Childers was supposed to join us, but she just messaged me saying that she had an emergency and she can't. Oh, oh um, no worries. No yes. worries. Um, and we are almost at time. I know that I packed so much into this presentation, right? So, um, ooh, ooh, are, are there more? Uh, yeah, let me give a few more moments for some um, observations. And also, if there's any observations from the audience perspective, I'd be open to hearing those too. And then I'm going to share some of the group things that we made together. So let me uh, pass the microphone to whoever else would like to make some comments. I just wanted to throw out right quick. I know I've already taken up some time, but I just have one more thing to say. Bouncing off what you said, Claudia, in 2020, 
I worked more than I had in the previous six years that I lived in Chicago because there were no physical barriers. I literally worked more in 2020, like my resume doubled in 2020 because there weren't physical barriers anymore. There were actually specifically companies who I knew had inaccessible spaces that were hiring me. And there were also, this is a, this is a thing to think about, companies who did not hire me because they wanted a certain look or a certain like physical skill stage combat, something like that, that hired me to read through their plays because I fit the character when they took out the physical component. Okay. Leaving that there. Yes. Okay. So you had to get on. You had to get on the mic and say those things because they were so vitally important for the room to hear. Can I pass the microphone to Amanda? I think I saw Amanda's hand up. And I think it, Monica, did you want to share some words? All right. Awesome. I, I'm passing it to you, Amanda. And then you pass it to Monica when you're done. Totally. Uh, sorry, it's just loud over here. I'm really interested But no, I remember in 2020, it was my senior year of high school. I was going into my senior year and my acting professor was like, actually, this works perfectly because we were doing The Tempest that year. And he was like, well, they were stuck on an island. Now we're stuck. So it's a virtual space. And while like, I'm five feet tall. So that is something that like, in that show, I've been cast in one role, but I got cast as Ariel, like the like ever present being. And I got to be like this really cool AI type thing. And they did really cool like, voice modulations and like design stuff all online which was really fascinating and it's also like I got to help my like cohort when I was in my senior year virtually we created a show together and they're like and I'm a huge dance person they were like oh do you want to choreograph something and I was like I've never choreographed before sure I'll make something that can fit in the screen and now I've choreographed for like I don't know how many shows but it's like one of the top things I do as an artist. So like those two things like would not have happened had we been on lockdown. It would probably not have happened in the real world just because assumptions. Yes, yes, yes. All right, Monica, come on, come on. I'm on fire here. Cause like, this is the entire point of why we're here. Yes, Monica. Yeah, absolutely. I've just been reflecting like throughout your whole presentation on um, like everything that I've been, I joined um, Seesaw in 2020, which was my freshman year of college. So, like I joined it when we were doing everything on Zoom and like my first, exp I took a year of being on Seesaw before I saw like any kids in the space. Um, but I know like the first production I ever worked on with Seesaw was we ended up reaching like three, four, five times the amount of kids we normally were able to reach because everything was online and we could, we like bought prop kits because normally like we have like a, a big thing is like our sensory experiences. And so we just bought bulk and sent out like 200 prop kits um, to kids like we had multiple states and like it was so cool and I would love to see Seesaw do something like that again in the future because we really only did it that one year but it was just um, really like an expansion of like what could even be possible. And I think also just, I've been reflecting on like what ITF has been, cause I produced it last year and was um, a participant in it the year before that. And just, I think the way it's just kind of shifted and like, I think what we landed on this year, like what Claudia, you were able to help Ashna kind of brainchild into existence was just really wonderful. And like, I think it's been really cool to see like, cause it's, it's just, been, it's a huge conversation that we have about it every year, but I think this has resulted in something like really wonderful. So I just want to put that in the space. I'm mad I don't have more time to spend with y'all. Let's look at the things that we made together. I'm curious about what we made together. So I'm going to share my screen one last time. Where's the buttons to let me share my screen? Claudia sharing her screen. Thank you so much for making me a co-host. So I have the power to do that. That was nice. Okay, first, no, actually, no, we'll start here. We'll start with our poem and then we will end with our word cloud. And I'm gonna, um, let's see, what do we have here? Things that we loved about cool theater access, sign language incorporated into choreography, heck yeah, integrated ASL, when it worked very well, yes. Kids in the audience could answer questions and speak throughout the show if they liked and no response was wrong, that's beautiful. Um, a theater they worked at realized their bathroom doors weren't wide enough for power chairs, a licensed contractor crew member spoke to the artistic director and the door was widened that same day. Oh, that is such a good story. That is such a good story. That reminds me, I'm breaking the rules. I'm telling a story like 
like, oh, no, two weeks ago, I was working with a group of folks and they had two accessible bathrooms and they were using one for storage. And I walked in and I was like, you have two accessible bathrooms. And somebody was like, oh, we're using that one for storage, but that one's accessible. And they saw my face because I went, huh. And the next day, the executive director had all of that storage in his office and but the bathrooms are accessible. Yeah. Um, seeing my first seesaw show and how much the kids responded to it and getting to learn from them and to learn about how I can make theater as enjoyable for everyone as it is to me and hearing stories and becoming more aware of what is needed now. I love doing an exercise where we all just kind of name things that we love in the space because like it's an act of manifesting. These are the things that are important to us. But why did we come here? Why Why is there an inclusive theater festival? What's the point of this? A bunch of people came. Students, adults, practitioners, audience members. People came here to brainstorm with special needs, to spread an idea, to present an idea for inspiration, community, learning, understanding, knowledge sharing, to share an idea for theater, theater to my students, world beating, ideas for teaching, innovation, to learn, education, connection, sensory theater, inclusivity, ideas, listening, celebrating. Y'all, these words, were typed into this form by people in a physical space yesterday. They were typed into this form by us in this digital space now. And this is all of us together. I am so, so happy that I could reach across time and space to be with you all here and there together. Inclusive theater, y'all, come on. Hey everyone, thank you so much, Claudia. You have such, like, as soon as you started speaking, Monica texted me and was like, like they have just such wonderful energy. And I was like, I know, I've seen it for like the past three months. Thank you so much for being with us today and for sharing that wonderful uh, word cloud. I think it's such a wonderful way to end uh, this festival and this experience that we've all had, this experience that I've had. Um, I am so grateful to all of our presenters for all of the amazing ideas they've shared here today. And if if there's one thing that we can take away from this experience, I think it's just that let's let's try our best to to bring everyone into the space the way all of these presenters have been working so hard to do, the way Seesaw has been working so hard to do. Um, I want to thank Monica and Matthew, who have been such amazing partners in helping me build this festival and do everything that was required um, in these past two months. I want to thank Claudia and Jesenia and my mama and Calling Up Justice for being such amazing mentors to me throughout this process and for teaching me so much more than I could I ever thought I could know about accessibility. Um, I want to thank HowlRound, Tia, Vijay, and Matthew, who have been so patient with me as we figured out how to get everything on HowlRound, how to, how to reach that platform, how to make sure video quality and everything else is working well. I want to thank Julia Marshall, Laura, Elise, Elizabeth, and Haley from the Seesaw team um, for just being such wonderful collaborators in this process and taking care of everything that I couldn't personally handle myself. Um, all the presenters for teaching us so much um, and all of you who attended and were such a wonderful audience. Thank you for engaging. Thank you for being in this in this space yesterday and today in whatever ways you could be. I, I appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. If even one person in this room takes just like a little bit more of a commitment to accessibility back from the space today, I think I think I'm happy with the festival that we've created together. Um, on that note, happy Diwali. Um, it's it's the Hindu New Year, and I think this is such a great way for me to begin my new year. Um, and have such a such a wonderful weekend ahead. Now it's it's over. Have such a wonderful week ahead, and so much seesaw love to all of you. Thank you for being with me in this space. Thank you. <laughs>